So now we can open up the floor to questions. Uh, please, uh, you know, uh, speak up so that we can hear you, and we will uh, follow the Williams tradition of beginning uh, taking questions from students. So, any students? Can you speak up? I'm yes. sorry, because we can't hear you. First of all, I, I would like to thank you, all the panel, the, the speakers. Uh, you said that the IMF is an um, international lender of last lot, resort. Don't you think so? It's just an incentive for the Ellen economy, rather than focusing on their uh, own real issues. They rely heavily on the lender of the last resort. And secondly, when IMF comes into the market, their original problem goes behind the scene. And um, there's a euphoric move in the market, and especially in the foreign exchange market. Is it justified? Okay. Uh, your question was directed at anybody in particular, or? Anybody want to take that? I think, she's, I'm, I think you're essentially raising, uh, if I may summarize, the, uh, what we all refer to as the moral hazard issue, right? Uh, so the IMF comes in and lands, and uh, it's not clear that uh, that doesn't take the country off the hook, uh, uh, and you get a big boost in the foreign exchange market, the financial markets, and have you really accomplished much in the way of uh, change? Is that a fair uh, summary of your? Um, I suspect you may get different views on that from the panelists. That's what we're here for. Uh, I don't think there is really much evidence of that uh, behavior, right? It is, it, it is the rare. Um, Finance minister that I've observed who's rushed to the fund as a way to solve his problem, his or her problems. Uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, usually they come too late rather than too early. Uh, uh, in fact, I don't know of any cases where they come too early. Uh, and uh, so I don't. And and the programs tend to be very uh, onerous uh, uh, for the country involved, largely because of the problems that build up. To, uh, uh, in advance, and as Guillermo pointed out in his uh, in his presentation, uh, and actually uh, Michael in his presentation too, in some cases, major cases, there are successes: Brazil, Mexico, Korea, uh, uh, and in some cases, Argentina, uh, for example, uh, they are failures. So it's I think not fair to say that you know it's only a, a sugar fix if you want to put it that way. Uh, to have the fund involved. Okay. Let, me, let me just um, reinforce what um, Ted has said. Uh, I, don't, I also cannot think of any uh, other country that has gone to uh, the IMF um, in advance you know, of, the, uh, um, of the problems that are facing. And this has to do, um, I think your question has to do um, a lot with uh, the issue of moral hazard. Um, and let me tell you, this, the, you know, those who are uh, mostly uh, against the uh, intervention of the IMF as a lender, as an international lender of last resort, tend to be academics. Okay? Um, uh, and that's oh, not a compliment. Yeah, that's not a, <laughs> you know, uh, if, you know, there's a lot of uh, in the academic side that, that also see uh, you know a positive point for uh, the IMF uh, as a lender of last resort, but you know as a uh, practitioner, uh, let me tell you that um, uh, it, 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 it it's really uh, clearly a very positive case, and I think that the uh, uh, the conditions that uh, in a more general framework by late by uh, Ted's presentation in terms of how, you know, how uh, <laughs> the conditionality uh, for future access of fund resources should be spelled out way before uh, the uh, requests for financings are made would go a long way uh, in reducing and diffusing these moral hazard uh, arguments that we have uh, touched upon. Okay. I, I'm one of the academics that he referred to, um, and I wrote uh, a number of papers a long time ago with Anna Schwartz, which basically made that argument. Um, my thinking's moved a little bit beyond that. Um, I think that the fund has been very successful in 
getting certain countries on a, onto a very positive growth trajectory. We mentioned Korea, Brazil, Chile. Um, but this moral hazard issue is, is still there, and as, as all of, two of us argued anyway, it's a big problem in what's going on in Europe. Thank you. Questions? Yes. I have a question concerning the IMF interaction in the European Union, especially for Greece, Portugal, and Spain. I wanted to know if that was associated with some clear condition, pre lending conditions. Where I'm sorry, can you speak up because I can't hear you? Well. My question is concerning the IMF intervention in the European Union. I wanted to know if the intervention was associated with some conditions. Were those conditions on the countries themselves or on the European Union? Uh, if yes, I wanted to know how so far are they doing on those? Compliance. My understanding is that the conditions are on the individual members and not the European Union. And that's what I thought might be a problem if those countries cannot uh, deal with those conditions, then um, what happens next? Uh, and do, where does the can get kicked down the road? And I, I argued that, well, if the European Union or the European Monetary Union was, a, was more of a, a European fiscal union, then, then there would be somebody like bigger in charge that the IMF could deal with in a more, in a more um, um, satisfactory way. See, uh, I think my biggest issue here is the form uh, in which uh, the IMF intervened, uh, you know, through the Troika. As I mentioned in my initial intervention, uh, the Europeans didn't want the IMF to begin with. So uh, one way of, I mean, the IMF cannot refuse, obviously, uh, you know, a member country uh, request for assistance. So uh, in the case, let's say, of Ireland and Portugal and Greece, I mean, the, the IMF could have come in and do a, a real analysis of what it would take, you know, to uh, bring the, col the country uh, into a, <clears throat> a growth path and, and lay out the issues and, uh, you know, then negotiate with the European Union, other lenders, you know, what would be uh, the conditions under which the IMF would intervene both uh, lending and providing, uh, you know, the necessary advice to the government. And the way it, it happened, though, is that, uh, the, you know, the uh, IMF played a secondary role, uh, you know, within the Troika. And in my, in my mind, uh, this is not uh, the way it has been before. And this is certainly not uh, a good way forward. So I think, you know, so partly just to summarize, Part of your question, there were conditions that were imposed on Greece, and they weren't supposed on the eurozone. There's a question about whether the fund should, as you've heard, the fund should have been involved. Uh, uh, you have a difference of view here on the right. That on the one hand, maybe it was too dangerous to get involved at all. But as uh, Guillermo was said, in some sense, you can't turn a country away. Uh, and when you're invited in, even if you're invited late, which was the case with Greece, and therefore part the whole process, uh, you can't say, well. Uh, we will penalize you because your partners didn't want you to come to the IMF uh, early on. Uh, I think there is a very important issue, uh, which and this is a part I agree with Michael, uh, and I've written on this subject and uh, may do so again, whether given that it is really a Eurozone crisis, right, there should be conditions imposed upon the other countries. Now, I don't think, uh, I'm not sure that uh, Michael in particular would agree, agree with this, but for example, uh, you have the strange situation of the ECB. It is the central bank for Greece. Greece is in, Greece is in, a, uh, in a recession. Why shouldn't interest rates, it, conventional monetary policy, interest rates be zero as they are in other, in other advanced countries this time? Why couldn't that be imposed on the ECB as a condition for the Greek program from the start? Right? Why can't you have conditions on the fiscal policy of the stronger countries, right? And say you must, at a minimum, allow automatic stabilizers to take effect, right? Uh, rather than following these mindless, if I may put it that way, uh, fiscal rules, uh, seemingly mindless fiscal rules, right? Which are going to exacerbate the, uh, the overall macroeconomic circumstances of the Eurozone. So there is a strong case, it seems to me, for the fund to put 
macroeconomic conditions on the entire Eurozone. So in that sense, I agree with both Michael and, and Guillermo that, they're, that they, they could have designed uh, and conditioned uh, the fund, could have designed and conditioned their uh, involvement in the, in the cases and may yet do so, if they take our advice or my advice, uh, uh, on, uh, on actions by the other members in support of the overall effort, which after all is support of making, uh, ensuring that the Eurozone doesn't blow up. Just let, let me let me um, pick on uh, very briefly on uh, you know uh, Ted's last remark. <clears throat> the uh, uh, let me take a case in point, which is Spain. Uh, Spain accumulated current account deficits, uh, which have resulted in a net debtor position uh, with respect to the, the rest of the world, in about a hundred percent of GDP. Okay? Germany currently uh, has the largest absolute surplus, current account surplus in the world, yeah? larger than China, uh, and equivalent to about 6% of, of Germany's GDP. I mean, shouldn't the, uh, the discussion be about rebalancing trade uh, and, uh, you know, rebalancing economic activity within Europe, apart from the financial issues and apart from the aid part? No, and, I, and I think that you know that's where the IMF could have come in, uh, again imposing conditions on the eurozone, not just on individual countries. That's just an example. Yeah, well, of course, yeah, I know. <laughs> Olivier. <laughs> Do you want to agree with us? <laughs> Is this on the record? <laughs> can, can you speak loud? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, on the IMF and the Euro, I, I find Michael's argument very convincing. If California got into trouble, I think nobody would think of asking the IMF to go in. Everybody would say, well, it's a US bond, and if it's a liquidity issue, there's a Fed. If it's a solvency issue, there's a government, there's a federal budget. You deal with it. If the plan of California was so bad that the US itself was in trouble, conceivably, then there would be a case for the IMF to come in, deal with the US, not with California, impose conditions which make California be better and maybe help the US if needed. So I think that there's absolutely no question that's the way we should think about it. And so in that sense, you know, why not? Uh, why is it that we did it differently in Europe? and in the Eurozone. You understand the political constraints as well as I do, and I'm not going to repeat them. The question is, why did we go into Ireland, Portugal, and Greece, understanding, I think, these issues? I, well, we were, you know, it became clear that these programs would be credible, only there was somebody else than the Europeans basically in charge. So I think we were asked to come in, and as you, as you notice, uh, it took a while to be asked uh, because we had we kind of had the knowledge and the credibility. Now that doesn't imply by itself that we should have put money, but in effect, if you're going to be part of the program, you have to have some skin in the game. Otherwise, you're just going to be completely marginal in uh, in the advice that, that you give. Now, in these programs, the uh, distribution was roughly two thirds European, one third. IMF. Why did it come out? It was largely the result of a political uh, bargaining game. The Europeans at the time seemed incredibly unwilling to put enough money to do it themselves, or to do most of it. And in the end, two thirds, one third looked like it could be done that way. Uh, but, but clearly, uh, ideally, it would have been better, uh, I think, from a conceptual point of view, if they had put more in and uh, now looking at, at Spain, why is it that again, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are asked or we are considering uh, being part of the program, the ECB has asked us to do it. Why is it that the ECB has asked? Precisely for the same reason, in the credibility of the program. Now again, the question is, does this require money? And I think the answer is again the same, which is that 
you cannot be you cannot just be monitoring a program that has been designed by others, especially if you don't fully agree with that program. So you have to be part of the design of the program, and to be part of the design of the program, you have to have some skin in the game again. There's absolutely no question that this is not going to be a two-third, one-third, uh, for two reasons. Uh, the amounts are much too large, and that has given some numbers. The teachers could not do it. Also, the Europeans, I think, have understood that they actually have now to put money when something like this happens, and so they are more open to putting more. So I think if it happens, we'll probably be part of a program, we'll probably have some money in, but uh, all your arguments uh, hold, which is that conceptually, uh, this should be dealt at the euro level with us dealing with the euro and all the implications this has. Thank you, Olivier. Anybody want to respond here? Yes, yes. No, I, 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 I like your comments very much. I mean, I was just thinking immediately of California. That was what I thought of. Um, like in Argentina, you didn't go and lend to the state of Santa Fe. I mean, that was you went and lent to Buenos Aires, and you said, well, you've got to work out the problem with the states and, of course, the provinces. And, of course, they didn't work out the problems, and eventually you walked away. So I mean, so I see that, that that's my analogy. You see, I see Europe exactly the same way, and if you don't do that, you're getting yourself more into in, you're getting you're getting yourself more exposed than you need to be. Well, but yeah, I mean, I think you actually there was more agreement in some sense on the panel here than one might have, at least I might have, ex ante expected. Uh, but I think the important question is is the one that Guillermo made, right? In some sense, you know, and you made implicitly, Olivier, which was, you know, you play with the cards that are dealt you, right? So you couldn't have said, you didn't, the IMF didn't have the luxury, and I think it would be wrong for the IMF to say, because this is a Euro problem, we will not get involved in Greece. That just is not, that's just not playing with the right cards. Now, you could argue how the game was played subsequently, but a member country, a member country should, uh, should be treated as a member country as long as you have that, that construct, even if, as I agree with Michael, desirable, and we all, I sense, agree, if Europe, because Europe is going to, the Eurozone at least is going to be viable, it has to be much more cohesive institutionally, and part of that would be, for example, as he said, single representation in the, in the funds, and so you could deal with the Eurozone as the member rather than this complex uh, mechanism we have now. But I actually think there's quite a lot of agreement on this issue, which is pretty surprising for this conference. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I obviously um, agree with all your um, comments, Olivier. Uh, my, my only, the, the question is the, uh, the degree of ownership uh, of the, uh, there are two levels, you know, one is the European, the European level, and we have already talked about that, and I think that, you, that you're right, and we, we, and we agree uh, in this panel that, uh, you know, conditions would have, it would be desirable to impose conditions on the, on the Eurozone as a whole, as it would be the case, as you, as you mentioned, if the UK has got in trouble. You know, the, condition, the, con, the, con, the conditionality would have been on the federal government of the United States, not in, not in California. Uh, uh, in terms of the actual uh, involvement, my, my problem is with the uh, hierarchy of the IMF and the Troika. Uh, and the, uh, the sort of political content that this involves, particularly, I, I'm not arguing against uh, you know the problem of Ireland or Portugal. Uh, this is why I concentrated on the Greek problem. I think that the IMF knew from the outset that the problem was totally inviolable, and it was kind of dragged into it. And this is something that, uh, in my view, well, a little bit happened in Argentina, but they they cut their losses. I mean, I remember very well the discussions we had around Argentina. Uh, there was a lot of doubts, um, but eventually the fund got its losses. So the question is, what's going to happen with Greece uh, in this second in this review? And, and I think it's a big question, and it's also a question of political economy. And I don't know if you have um, anything else to add about that, Olivia, at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's a backward question. But, 
From the panel to the... Uh, you could, you could to the next, next. You couldn't be doing the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let me call on Uri in the back. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, I'm curious if the panel has a view on why the Europeans felt it was necessary to lend uh, 30 or 40 percent of GDP uh, to Greece and others uh, when uh, uh, there had been successful rescues of uh, Korea and Mexico with 5 or 6 percent of GDP. What is the difference uh, that led them to, to uh, put in, together with the IMF, such large amounts of money? I think the answer is pretty simple. One is uh, Greece was much more integrated with the global financial system in terms of the European central system than even Mexico was in 1994 and, and Korea was in 1997. Uh, so that accounts, I think, for the numbers and that has to do with the capital account crisis dimension of, of these uh, of these uh, of these uh, of these uh, measures. I think that's the that's the principal explanation and the other secondary exp explanation, which is positive relative to Europe, is that the European par partners recognized that they had to do something. So they were not collectively, I think, smart, both for economic as well and financial as well as political reasons, willing to throw uh, Greece over the edge uh, in 2000, early 2010, even though some European politicians are prepared to do it today. Right. Um, I think there's a there's an historical analogy here uh, to what to what what what's been happening in Europe and what happened in the um, in the Bretton Woods system way back in the 1960s. So, in in the 1960s, the problem was sterling was was the UK. It was the sick man of Europe, and and the pound was the sort of Second line of defense in the in the uh, in the Bretton Woods system. So the dollar was the number one currency, but but sterling was also an international reserve currency, and so there was this there was a series of, of sterling crises that started in 1959, and they had them they had four of them, and it finally ended with sterling devaluing in 67, and in each case there was a massive rescue put together by the G10, by the IMF, U.S. was heavily involved. The, the Federal Reserve swap lines just ballooned in this period. And so why did they do this? I mean, it seems so inevitable, the way people were thinking at the time. A lot of academics looking at it were, were positive that sterling was going to get shot down. Okay, why did they do it? Because the U.S. saw it as, as, as that if sterling goes, the dollar is next. And so I think what's going on in Europe is this existential feeling that we can't let this country go because this is going to lead to, to, to uh, it's going to lead to contagion, and even though a lot of arguments have been made, which I think are actually quite reasonable, that they could have, in a sense, excised Greece quite early once they realized that it was hopeless, and they could have worked something out. But it was the, the philosophy of, of Europe, the the the, the uh, sort of ethos uh, within the European Union, is what kept it going, and it, it will it will keep it going until things become hopeless, and they do. They, I don't see Europe as falling apart, but I see Greece as going, and I see them, they, and they are moving in the direction towards more integration, fiscal union, et cetera, banking union. Thank you. Uh, I'll well, take uh, Bob first. And budgets. <coughs> you talk about, you just, I was fascinated by the, <coughs> your attention to budget. And at the bottom of your list, you had, uh, do not lend to insolvent institutions. Now, that's debatable in terms of the externalities. But does anyone believe, does anyone in this room believe that Greece is not insolvent? And what is the moral hazard of lending to an insolvent institution? Well, as someone who's not in this room, who's Bill Klein, my colleague at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, will tell you that it's not insolvent. It, it is, it, 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 insolvency for government really has to the capa depends on the capacity of the citizens of the country to adjust, right? Uh, through raising taxes and changing the structure of the economy and so forth and so on. And, and an example that is often cited in within this context is Latvia. So Latvia adjusted under IMF tutelage 
they chose not to devalue, right? They had a massive adjustment, right? And uh, Anders Oslin would say this is successful. So it is a question of, I hate this phrase, political will. So I think it is essentially impossible to, to definitively say whether a country is solvent or insolvent. Remember Chile in the 1980s. Chile had the largest debt burden, external debt burden, of any of the emerging market countries at that time. It did not actually have any IFI programs for political reasons. And it did adjust, right? And was the most successful adjuster, right? So it actually didn't have a Brady plan. It didn't have a write down. It had some debt buyback, uh, debt for equity swaps. So it really is an issue of political will. A solvency is an issue of political will. So it's will they pay, not can they pay. Yeah, at least that, now, you could turn the argument the political will the other way and say, well, they don't have the political will. Well, therefore, by definition, they're insolvent. But I think it's very tricky to, to, to assert uh, solvency or insolvency, in my opinion. So let, let me um, get a little bit of uh, disagreement here uh, in, in, uh, within the panel, you know, Good. because we have been too much in agreement so far. Uh, uh, let's begin with Chile. Uh, Chile had, you know, you're right, uh, Ted, the highest debt burden, uh, which uh, it did not reach 100% of GDP. It was more like 90% at the worst moment. So that's, uh, that's just to begin with, you know. Uh, second, Chile had Pinochet, uh, which is an important factor there. That's eh? the last night's lecture. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, you know, go, going back to yesterday's lecture, uh, uh, obviously uh, <clears throat> the political system was uh, highly centralized and, uh, well, let's put it very bluntly, it was uh, dictatorial. So, uh, you know, the, the, these guys uh, uh, had, a, had an advantage in, 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 in that sense, you know. Uh, third, I mean... <clears throat> I agree with Ted that it's impossible uh, at the outset to, to uh, state whether a country is solvent or insolvent. But it's, uh, but, it, but, it, but it, I mean, there are some, some uh, quite compelling uh, numbers that you can, like, that you can see through the experience of many countries that have gotten into trouble. Um, and uh, the basic test there is uh, whether. Uh, you know, debt would eventually be sustainable and economic growth can, can recuperate. Uh, and if, uh, th these are the two basic things, it's the numerator and the denominator, you know. So uh, in, in the case, if the dynamic, it's, it's not only a question about political will. It, you know, it is the, the, the kind of effort that takes and the political, I mean, and the economic structure that can support it that can support an adjustment problem, that eventually leads to economic growth. And that is, that is, I think that is the key point. And the problem in Greece is that the, you know, that the denominator keeps shrinking. You know, I, I as I mentioned, uh, GDP uh, is down about 25% from its, from its peak. And the level of debt in absolute terms, in, in, in Euro terms, is higher than at the, uh, not, not, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, uh, this is wrong because they, they already had a, uh, a, a write down, you know, uh, but still after the write down, it's close to the levels that it was before the write down. Hmm? So, I mean, it makes no sense. I mean, did they, and uh, what is gonna happen in Greece, I think is that they will kick the can for another year, another two years, uh, until uh, you get uh, Spain and Italy more or less in line. And hopefully uh, the institutional framework of the uh, European system would have evolved sufficiently then uh, to be able to uh, do something about Greece uh, without this contagion effect uh, in the other periphery countries. Thank you. Yes, sir, two-handed, yes. Um, uh, I take Ted's point, but um, uh, uh, if certain people were here, they would, they would say you're, it's sounding an awful lot like the confidence fairy. What also matters is the level of external demand to pull this off, the environment and the international environment in which this internal adjustment's uh, taking place. And uh, to go back to Bob's question, do we see 
domestic demand in the northern part of Europe uh, expanding rapidly enough to make it practical for the Greeks, Greeks to be able to take sufficient internal adjustment mechanisms to pull it off. I think the question should be answered. In well, but my, but my, my answer, he asked the question, does anyone believe? And I actually answered for someone else, if you may remember, for Bill Klein, right? I mean, I, th I think it, but my point, I think it is, I agree with that, right? The environment, both the growth, the domestic growth environment and the external environment and the whole, what we've been talking about in terms of Europe, Europe, the rest of Europe being supportive of adjustment in the countries that are adjusting is, to say nothing of the world as a whole, right, uh, is particularly negative. Uh, uh, and uh, and so it is a is it is a long shot. And I my view at the beginning of Greece, I agreed with my late colleague Mike Musa. Right? If you had a, you could not say in May of 2010, let's have a write down because you know for sure the write down would have been so small it would not made a a smidgen of difference. Right? Right? So actually, when they had so it would made some sense to try to kick the can down the road and get yourself in a position so you had some way to parameterize how much of an adjustment there was involved. Now you're in that world, right? You had a bit, bit of a process last summer, fall, and I credit the fund actually for pushing that ball much further down the road in terms of the write down than they did. And then the and they probably could have should have pushed a little further, but the fund did, a, I think, an admirable job of forcing the Europeans and the world to face up to reality. Uh, so I think it's, uh, but all I'm trying to say, I think it's an open question. I don't think it's, it's, it's open and shut, and the environment clearly is, is horrible, right? both in terms of Europe, internally to Europe, and in terms of the world as a whole. Yes, uh, two-handed, Lurie. Uh, the main difference between Chile and uh, Greece is that. Main difference between Chile and Greece. Well, the main difference though, is that Chile, Chile could, could devalue the currency. Greece cannot devalue the currency. Yeah, well, that's just a, but the, 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 I, 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 he said the main difference, yes, and that's correct, right? And, and that's what Michael said. The main difference between Chile and Greece was that Chile did have the exchange rate instrument, and Greece does not. Right, and that obviously that's part. If you want to think about it, that's part of the environment. So they're playing the game with at least one hand tied behind their back. I don't, do, don't think disagree with okay. that. Okay, uh, Jim. Uh, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm afraid of that. Okay. Uh, um, let me ask. <laughs> let me ask a question that relates back to yesterday's last panel, the panel that I was on and you raised here. How do you think that this episode of the IMF with Greece and the way it was involved is going to affect the views of the world in allowing the IMF to take a more leading role, greater international cooperation of some sort, and so on? How do you think this episode is going to affect that? I think I think that that uh, that most 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 people understand that the problem is not the IMF. The problem is the eurozone, and uh, the I, and the IMF got pushed into a lot of this. I mean, there is this issue that I raised, which probably isn't very important, but raised about 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 the politics of the IMF and the MD, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but but I think that that the world realizes the problem is the eurozone. And, and, and if the Eurozone can get its act together, then things would go back to a more normal relationship between a sovereign, feder a fiscal federal sovereign and, and the fund. But if that doesn't happen, I think there might be some restrictions put on the fund's ability to go into a situation which is not clear cut. <clears throat> See, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think that the, um, <clears throat> from a political perspective uh, and from a policy maker's perspective I think that the IMF uh, <clears throat> should have but it's still time to uh, to be much more uh, I would say um, um, you know vocal uh, in terms of what's to be needed I mean the IMF has been sometimes uh, they have come out sometimes they have been silent uh, for example, in this whole all CB, the ECB involvement, uh, the provision of liquidity, in general, they have been supportive 
uh, of all the measures that have been taken by the ECB, uh, in, you know, in terms of bridging the gap <coughs> so that the institutional framework can be strong enough to, uh, to support the euro. And I think that has been a positive role. And maybe uh, it has been an effective one in, 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 in the sense that the IMF has not been up in front, you know. But um, you know, the IMF, uh, for the rest of the world and for its future credibility, uh, should be, uh, you know, as he would have done in the case of the US, you know, signaling the externalities and the effects on the rest of the world of a Europe that's not been fixed, uh, <clears throat> to push much harder, you know, for uh, the conditions that need to be done at the individual country level. For example, the, the IMF hasn't really said anything about uh, Germany's surplus. You know, I mean, uh, well, it has said some, some a little bit. You're right. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, I, I think this is a big issue in the Eurozone. Hmm? I think you uh, need to, I think. I don't know. So, um, well, I, I think that, you know, Greece's failure, on the other hand, uh, if managed correctly, I mean, Argentina did not destroy the IMF, you know, and Greece will not destroy the IMF either. I mean, that, that is for sure. Uh, but, but it will certainly put a dent on it. So when I teach, Jim, when I teach the course that you and I alternately teach, I like to ask the students and say, who is the IMF? And the, uh, or the, who is the World Bank? Uh, and so at one level, it is the members themselves, right? Disciplining each other, as some of the other discussions have pointed out, and Gary's point, made that point. At another level, it is the management and staff, right? Now, to be fair, as, uh, uh, right, in terms of just one trivial example, ECB monetary policy, the IMF staff for at least nine or 12 months has been pushing the ECB to be easier on monetary policy. So the IMF staff is in the right, in my view, personal view, in the right position mm -hmm. uh, on that. Uh, but the IMF membership, meaning uh, uh, probably in sort of the review of, I guess they, I can't remember what they did in the least Euro review, whether they endorsed this view or not. But in some sense, they have not, they have not engaged. They have not said, if we're gonna do another program for Greece, we have to put conditions on the ECB. Uh, so they blinked, but that's the membership that is blinked, right? Rather than, so I, but I think it is an excellent question. I, I, uh, I think you see, uh, if I use you as an example, Guillermo, um, uh, a concern uh, that uh, the and, and that that the, the the legitimacy issues in the fund. Uh, which revolve around the oversized role of both in voting power and, uh, and membership in the executive board have been, have been highlighted by all this, right? And, and the, real, the really important question for the Europeans is do they recognize that they uh, almost inevitably, if the fund is gonna be survived in any way, are gonna be cut down substantially in size uh, as a result of this. I'm not quite sure how it's gonna happen, but I know the, the level of, exa of exasperation, if I may put it that way, that my good friend from Mexico has is, uh, is illustrated. <laughs> I, my sense is from talking to people around the world in other non-European countries is he is mild by comparison uh, to what you hear from uh, opinion leaders in uh, other parts of the country and I, world. And, and I don't think the Europeans understand this. Uh, uh, I've been a few meetings where the Europeans have been there and they, they get this outrage coming, polite diplomatic outrage, and they just don't hear what's going on. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, we do have one more, one more question, but I think we're out of time, so could we do that at coffee, please? Uh, we need to break for coffee, and we reconvene at 1130. Is that right? Okay. Thank you very much to all our panelists. Yeah, yeah.